Um, to give an inaugural lecture is a very difficult genre. It's a very difficult discipline. But I've practiced. I've done it several times before. <laughs> and to comfort those who heard my last inaugural talk, I can tell you I changed the talk. It's a new talk. <laughs> so um, you may ask the question, how come he made it to gastrophysics? There's a kind of a journey behind that. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about that journey because I'm a physicist, or consider myself as a physicist, a physical chemist. And many, many years ago, I started studying things like magnetism, using fast computers, trying to understand phases of matter, phase transitions, critical phenomena. And um, over time, I got more and more interested in more complex systems. And in those days, I was at the University of Aarhus. And then I moved to the Technical University of Denmark as a research professor in material science or materials physics and working on computational physics. And I gradually got an interest in more and more complex and soft and sort of dirty systems, what we call soft matter. And food is soft matter, and I'll come back to that. So for a number of years, I, I worked at the physics department at DTU, and then I moved to a chemistry department and uh, working as a physical chemist and gradually moving more and more into biological inspired problems. And um, in 2001, I left DTU and went to the University of Southern Denmark and for many years worked on biophysics and biomembranes, moving closer and closer to food. Because what is food? Food is the part of the world we eat. And uh, most of that we eat are either something that has been alive or maybe still our lives. So having a background in biophysics is a good entry point to food. Um, and over the last, say, 10 years, I got more and more interested, and particularly why my interest in communication of science, I got more and more interested in the science of food. Uh, I love to cook, so that's a good starting point as well. So finding out how you can actually combine an interest in gastronomy and cooking with science, and in recent years also the communication of science, that has really, that's been my journey. And I'd like uh, uh, to use this opportunity to mention my, my great mentor and, and a friend, uh, the late Maya Bloom, um, a professor of physics at the University of British Columbia in Canada, who really sort of uh, taught me how to move from one discipline to the next. And I think that has given me great joy in doing science. So, what about gastrophysics? So I'm going to tell you what it is, try to define it. It's still sort of in, in a native state. Um, and um, I'll give you some examples of what gastrophysics, what it could be. And um, during the, the, uh, my talk, you will get some little tastings. You each got a little boat. Don't eat it until I tell you to. <laughs> so um, physics is a discipline that at least physicists say it's the most important science in the world. And that's, that's it's also a very old science. And physics has sort of the uh, the um, history that it constantly moves into new fields and turn them into physics in the eyes of the physicist. So chemistry were revolutionized by physicists who turned it into physical chemistry, chemical physics, geology into geophysics, biology into biophysics and biological physics. There are even some physicists who work in, in economy and turn it into econophysics. So why not also do the same thing with gastronomy and the, and the science of food? Then the question comes, what is actually gastronomy? And we can go back to maybe the father, or at least part of the science behind gastronomy, Guayang uh, Savarang, who says that gastronomy is the logical, constructed, and ordered knowledge about everything that pertains to man and his capacity of living being who consumes food. So that's the statement about a human being who actually interacts with food and the world. And it's not only a matter of getting, um, getting uh, uh, nutrition. <coughs> In the Danish Gastronomical Academy, um, um, it said uh, we distinguish between cooking, that is the art and craft of preparing food and menus, and gastronomy, that is a reflection over cooking menus and food. So gastronomy is not the same as cooking. It's reflections about cooking and also food culture. And the way I like to present uh, gastrophysics is sort of in this triangle um, between gastronomy and cooking and where there's a constant interaction between the, the different parts of this approach, uh, approach to food. Little, just a little bit of, of history, and, and uh, uh, Venda actually described uh, some of it. So um, it, quite early chemists got an interest in food because 
I mean, after all, uh, we, all of us have a lab in our home. We have a kitchen and a lot of chemistry going on in the lab. So uh, Akon was uh, uh, writing a book about what was called culinary chemistry. And then we had Briar Samarang in 1825. And one may more say that may be more behavioral science or physiology. Um, then uh, Nicholas Curdy was a low temperature physicist from Oxford who really brought physics into, into uh, the game of, of cooking. And he might have been the first one who suggested the word gastrophysics, but it was not used much until recently. Uh, McGee, who many of you know, certainly students would know in his wonderful book, he's more a food writer, but he combines physics, chemistry, and biology um, in, in the study of food. Uh, he's a French chemist. Uh, his, his approach is certainly more chemistry. Uh, then there's an American scientist, Mirvold, who wrote a tome of five big books, uh, which you could really say it's the physics and chemistry of food and cooking. And in recent years, um, some of the psychologists have come on, on, on the scene, in particular, Herbert Spence from, from Oxford, who he wrote two books, uh, and one just came out, and he actually calls it gastrophysics, and I think he's stolen the word from us, <laughs> which is fine. But if you read his definition of gastrophysics, it's contraction of gastronomy and, and uh, 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 psychophysics, that is more a, a psychological approach. And, and in his book, there's, there's mighty little of physics. Um, then, um, uh, as Wenda alluded to, at this university, there was uh, actually a pioneering uh, uh, work quite early on uh, introducing the field of molecular gastronomy. And there's a, there's a, an, a review here, which is a, is a wonderful review that really, really gives a great overview of the field. And to many, in many respects, one could call it a gastrophysical piece of work. There's a definition of molecular gastronomy in, in, that, um, in that paper. And it says that molecular, molecular gastronomy is a scientific study of why some food tastes terrible, some mediocre, some good, and occasionally some absolutely delicious. So that's the starting point. So the question is, what is, what is gastrophysics in, 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 in my world? And to me, I think I would like to present this very simple way. The gastrophysics takes its starting point in the empirical world of gastronomy. So we have gastronomy there, which is a reflection about cooking, and we have cooking. And that could be sort of interesting questions that come up. For instance, how do I make crisp and crunchy cucumbers? And you're going to taste one in a little while. And so that's a gastronomical inspiring question. And now you could think of it as a piece of food. Um, and um, you can take it into the lab. And you use your, all, all the techniques you got from physics, chemistry, and, and bordering sciences, whether it's theoretical or experimental. Um, and um, you study it, and you taste it, and just like what you only do when you do science. And you may come up with some um, uh, answers to the question, how do you make uh, crunchy vegetables. And um, if you're lucky, you may end up with a result. Uh, you can publish it in scientific journals, uh, depending on which sort of field you refer to, some in biophysics journals, some in, some in food science journals, some in chemistry journals. But the outcome of that could be a recipe, an instruction, how to actually make a product. So gastrophysics takes you from the, the, the gastronomical world. It takes you into the lab. You do your science whatever scientist you are, and I'm a physicist or physical chemist, you end up with some maybe recipe. So you actually go back to gastronomy. The recipe could be something all of you could use. It could also be something a company is using. So that's the way I would like to think of gastrophysics. And I'll now give you some example. So just to, to um, emphasize, gastrophysics has focused on the gastronomical um, potential and value in particular in relation to, to, to taste, flavor, and, and mouthfeel. And so in one, one way, you can say gastrophysics, possibly together with neuroscience, they could form the scientific underpinnings of gastronomy. Um, the way I would like to apply biophysics, I would draw on physical chemistry, molecular biophysics, soft matter science, and, um, and, and various other sciences. So even though, the aspects of cooking, food science, nutritional and health sciences, and sensory science, it's not identical to any of these sciences. And the viewpoint is that of a physicist. Sometimes my physicist friends, they say, what is it you're doing? 
astrophysics, is that really physics? And then I tell them, well, physics, that's what physicists do. So that's the easy, <laughs> that's, that's the easy answer. And uh, usually it is, um, and I've experienced that several times before also in my own career, that when you're sort of starting a new field, people are all, always very skeptical. Where is this leading? Is this really science? But I've just listed here a, a number of universities, uh, leading universities around the world, who are actually you now working on combining science, that is the work of scientists together with, with chefs. And uh, this is, uh, is happening here um, at the uh, University of Copenhagen and in particular at Nordic Food Lab, and also other places. Um, before I give you the examples of what gastrophysics is, I'll just mention um, 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 an initiative and a national center I've been involved in for the last uh, three years called Smay for Liu, Taste for Life, which is uh, generally uh, supported by the Nordea Foundation. And um, uh, in the, the mission of this center is to convey knowledge in particular about taste to mostly to young people, but also adults. And we have structured this center, which now encompasses about 50 people across the country in uh, areas of learning, didactics, gastrophysics, and craft and innovation. So up here you will meet people who know how to, to teach uh, young people. Here you will meet uh, a lot of the scientists, physicists, chemists, sensory sciences, and so on. And here you meet the chefs and gastronomical entrepreneurs. And I, I, I'll mention it uh, when, a little later when I come uh, to, towards the end because uh, I'd like to give the examples of how science and new science can be driven by uh, communication. Because usually you say, um, and this is what we are told from ministry and, and, and uh, universities, you have to communicate your science. And, and so you do sort of science-driven communication. I'd like to turn it around and give you examples that quite often and, and the, the area of food and food science and gas gastrophysics is wonderful in order to operate turning it around. That is that you do communication driven research and I'll give you examples how what that could be. My examples, and they will be followed by some tasting on, on the little boat here. Uh, I'll talk about something that is close to my heart that is umami, the, the fifth taste. The umami, which I've taught it is called and I'll speak to you about the texture of food, mouthfeel a little bit about kinesthesis, and then I'll, I'll describe some weird organisms I'm interested in, macroalgae or seaweeds and also cephalopods, and, and that will be the end of my presentation. And I'll, I'll, I'll close by some possibly ideas for, for culinary food innovation. Now, I'm the very proud um, uh, ambassador of Japanese cuisine, which I, I'm very uh, pleased with. I'm, I'm um, um, being appointed by the, the Japanese ministry to be food ambassador. So it's a pleasure for me to take you to Japan. We'll go 100 years back in time, uh, around 1900, and we'll meet uh, the scientist uh, Kikuno Ikeda. He was trained in Europe by the very famous uh, Ostwald, who later won the Nobel Prize. And, and Ostwald, he know, knew all the tricks of how to use uh, physics and chemistry. So he really founded f physical chemistry. And uh, Ikeda, uh, Dr. Ikeda, when he came back to, to Tokyo, he, he set his mind to figure out how come that Japanese soups taste umai. And umai means delicious. And in order to understand what he then did, you have to know the recipe of the Japanese the soups, uh, or Japanese dashi, which is really is kind of a soup stock, a soup broth. But it's much more than that. It's the whole principle of cooking. And I'll come back to that um, a little later. Um, you use two weird ingredients to make the soup, and you, many of you, I'm sure, would have it in miso soup because you use that kind of uh, soup stock. You use two uh, weird ingredients, um, and one is a, a, a brown algae, uh, Saccharina japonica. It's a, in the same family as the a sugar kelp, uh, which many of you know. This is folded five or six times. This is huge. This is grown, farmed in Hokkaido, in the northern part of Japan. And some of you who are close can see there's some white stripes on it. This is where the deliciousness sits. This will seep out in water when you soak it in water. So the recipe is very simple. You cut off a piece of this, put it in water, let it steep there for a little while, take it up to 60 degrees, maybe for 20 minutes, 
strain off the seaweed and then you put in another weird product, at least for, for a day in a weird product, and it's here, it's called Katsubushi. You're going to taste an extract of this seaweed a little later when you have tastings outside, uh, where you get a konbu dashi, but you'll also taste this other product that completes the soup. It's the second part that provides the deliciousness. The deliciousness. Something seeps out of this uh, seaweed, I'll tell you what it is. Something seeps out of this when you put it in the soup. Of course, you don't use it like this. This is a fish, or used to be a fish. It's five times over conserved. It's, it's salted, it's cooked, it's dried, it's fermented and it's smoked. And it take, it take five months, and after that, it's called the hardest foodstuff in the world. You shave it in very thin uh, uh, slices here, very, very thin uh, with a shaver, and toss it in the soup, take it up to, to boiling, strain it off, and then you have yudashi. That's, a, that's the whole secret, uh, and I say the main secret of, of the uh, Japanese, Japanese cuisine. And you will taste such a dashi uh, because um, Roberto Flora has prepared something for you. You're going to get outside a little later. So this happened in 1909. Then in 1917, there was a, a, a pupil of, of uh, Dr. Ikeda Kodama who uh, figured out in and, and the fish product here, there's a high amount of another compound, which is a nucleotide in, in inosine, from in, inosinic acids and nucleic acids, and the combination of, of the two that provides for the deliciousness. So uh, Ikeda, he coined a new word, uh, umami, which is contraction of umai and mi, so it's sort of the essence of deliciousness, the most delicious of the delici of delicious food. And, and so we ended up with this new word. And the bold thing of um, the Kato was to propose that this is a basic taste. So in addition to the four classical tastes, sour, bitter, sweet, and, uh, and, and salt. salt, yes. That's the five classical uh, basic tastes. There's a fifth taste. And a basic taste is a taste which cannot be combined by the other basic tastes. So that's something very fundamental. And very few believed him, and it took almost 100 years before it, it was accepted. Um, and it only was accepted, really, after the, the, the discovery of the uh, receptor, or what, well, now a couple of receptors that is found on the taste buds. So it's a proper taste in the sense that there's, uh, there's a signal from a receptor. Uh, so this is a D-protein coupled uh, heterodimer. Uh, that sits in the membranes, the taste membranes in, in, in the cells and the taste buds, and it uh, can bind something from the seaweed. It's a, a, a free amino acids or the salts of the free amino acids. We call it glutamate, and then it can bind something from the fish. In this case, inosinate. There are two binding sites, and um, uh, this is the way it works. So it's on the taste buds. Uh, in the tongue, on the taste buds, and in the, in, the, in the neural cell membranes. And just to give an example, how a physicist would then look at this problem, you would take the receptor and see if you can understand how come that if you have, if you have something from the glutamate and a little bit of the inosinate, how come that you, you really um, enhance the, the, the flavor. And this is something we worked on for a, a couple of years ago, something we would never done unless some of us had an interest in food and deliciousness. So we started the receptor on a molecular level and figured out how the molecular dynamics of this receptor shows that when you have co-binding of glutamate and one of the nucleotides, you get what the chemists call an, an allosteric action. You, you have an allosteric mechanism. The binding of one is strongly enhanced by the binding of something else. So that's the secret. That's the secret of, of umami. That is that you need these two parts to, to um, stimulate the receptor. And those of you who cook uh, probably know that say, if you make, for instance, a brown gravy, something that could be terrible, but if it's made in the right way, it can be very tasty. And what is usually uh, the case is you have to add a little bit at the end. And it's not salt, it's not sugar, it's not acid. It's usually maybe a bit of fish sauce, a little bit of green, tea, green cheese, maybe a bit of Parmesan cheese, maybe a little bit of anchovy. And it's all tickling the other part of the of receptor. So this is pure, uh, this is really pairing. I have um, 
um, a table here. I, and of course, you can't read it all, but there are two uh, um, axes here. This is glutamate axis. Here, there's basically nothing. This is milk. There's no glutamate in milk. There's a lot of glutamate in mother's milk, by the way. It's a different thing. Uh, it's only when it's fermented you get a lot in cheeses. This is nucleotides uh, from hardly anything up to a lot. And I'm basically showing this picture just to indicate to you that the, the seaweed here, the, the dashi, the, 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 what is used in dashi, the kombu and the katsubushi, there no other, I have found no other foodstuff that is maximized. So that was a very good uh, invention of, of uh, Japanese chefs. So this uh, pairing, which is a scientifically based principle, <coughs> which is very diff different from the principle of pairing that has sort of milled around in, in the circles of chefs over years where they say certain things fit nicely together. I'm sure they do on the palate, but there's no scientific mechanism understood uh, uh, behind it. But behind, uh, there's a mechanism behind this. Uh, the umami pairing, the umami synergy, so konbu and katsubushi is an example here. And by the way, if you don't eat fish, you're a vegetarian, you will take shiitake, which is high in another nucleotide um, uh, called guanolate. But the same principle is, is present in all cuisines around the world. So egg and bacon, cheese and ham, tomatoes and beef, this is a sauce bolognese, Italian, this is Italian umami. This is sort of a Western good soup. You combine meat and soup stuff. You combine meat and vegetables to make a good soup stock, and you can just carry on. Look at the tables and construct your own umami um, power bomb. So now you're going to try an umami power bomb because I'll take a little cookie for you. And before you take it, you should know there's gluten in it. So those of you who don't eat gluten, don't, don't eat it. And there's also some shrimp. So if you have uh, allergy to shellfish, don't, don't eat it. Um, so this is just a simple butter cake. Um, and, um, but there are two unusual things in it. And there, there is Westerhausost, so it's a Danish hard cheese with a lot of glutamate. And then there's shrimp heads that have been dried and smoked. And you get, just get this tiny bit, you, you, you may, so, so try it, eat it. <laughs> and you may say, why does it just give us such a little cake? Why not a bigger one? And once you've eaten it, you, you will know why. Because it's so filling. It's so intense in taste. And while I now uh, carry on with my presentation, please notice that this, what is developing in your, uh, your mouth for the next five, 10 minutes, that is umami. There's of course also other tastes in this cookie. There's, I mean, there's sugar in, so it's sweet. And so um, maybe there's also a little bit bitter. There's a cayenne pepper in it. So there's also a little bit of uh, on your tongue. But it's, it's filling you and it's lingering off very slowly. That's the characteristics of umami. Now, some, some years ago, we asked ourselves the question, could we make a Nordic dashi? And at that time, that was the first time I got uh, in contact with the Nordic Food Lab, uh, which at that time were on a boat um, uh, just next to Noma. And uh, I, I did some work with um, uh, the, the then chef at the, Norma, uh, or the, uh, the um, Nordic Food Lab, Lars Williams, and there were two chefs, uh, Torsten Vilgo and, and Søren Vest. And, and, and we started um, various dashis from Nordic seaweed. So the question is, could you make these Nordic, uh, Nordic dashi? And, and of course, why not? But no one has really thought about it before. And the chefs uh, said, well, there's this red seaweed dulse, which is a wonderful seaweed. And they say, well, that, it has a lot of umami. But of course, as a, as a scientist, you, you're skeptical. Say, is, it, is it really umami? It may taste delicious, but is it umami? So, so we go and measure it. So this is gastrophysics in the sense that it's a physicist who sort of also is part of it. It's a gastronomical question. Can we make Nordic dashi? Um, and we look at different ingredients. And then we say, well, there's probably some umami in this. Then we go to the lab. And we start it by the various techniques we got. And then we go back to the kitchen and maybe end up with a recipe. In this case, we actually ended up with a recipe. And um, this is actually um, a recipe uh, we, we fought to get into a scientific journal. So uh, there are three recipes in this paper. Um, it's a while ago now. This is a paper. I mean, it's, this is not a high level journal, but it's actually the, one of the papers I've got the most response to and the, what I had most 
enjoy writing. So it's written, I mean, we have a, uh, we have a primary producer, we have a top chef, we have a chemist, and we have a physicist. And um, it actually sparked other, uh, after a lot of interest. Let me just show you some, some uh, pictures here. This is from Iceland, where it's very easy to pick the dolls at low tide. This is Eulfur, who picks at low tide and produces wonderful uh, dolls. And when you dry it, it looks like that. And here you see the little spots of sea salt and, and also, uh, also glutamate. And I'm not going to bother you with, and, and um, um, bother you with it, the technical detail. But this is a kind of thing you will measure. You will measure the three amino acids and look at the amino acid spectrum, and compare them with other other dashes. And here it, it turned out that that uh, dulse is very high in glutamate. And actually, currently, currently at uh, at the, the section I'm in now at, 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 at food, we are. We are starting a whole range of, of seaweeds from all over the world to make a, com a, a quantitative comparison of, of the umami potential for the different uh, seaweeds, combining sort of physical chemistry with sensory science and actually measuring the compounds, both the taste compounds but also the aroma, aroma compounds. So in this uh, little paper, there were actually three recipes how to impart umami to dishes that have very little umami. Uh, this is this is a, um, ice cream made from milk. Milk, unfermented milk has very little glutamate. It could be a fresh cheese, or, or you can you can put it in the, in the bread dough. For a number of years, I've been working with a, a chef and, and very good friend of mine, who I've also been writing several books with, uh, Klaus Stürbeck, and uh, he he sort of uh, he liked to sort of use the waste in his kitchen as much as he can. So. We talked about it, and then he ended up saying, why don't we make a dash out of waste? So this is waste in the sense that nowadays when people cook potatoes, they either peel them or they throw away the water in which you boil the potatoes. But potato water is actually very high in free glutamate. And in, in the old days, maybe still, some are still doing that. I'm doing it. You're, you're using the potato water. You never throw away the potato water because it's very good to impart flavors to, for instance, to vegetables, or you use it in, in, in a gravy. So from po potatoes, in particular old potatoes and potato with a peel, you're high in free glutamate. How do you get the synergy on your mama receptor? Well, you look up, what else have you got? And there we have uh, the, uh, the, uh, the shrimp in a, in a restaurant kitchen. They throw away a lot of shrimp heads. So why not use them? They're high in inosinate, dry them. You can even smoke them in order to get a similar flavor as you have in the katsubushi, and um, grind them, and then you have a powder you can combine with the, with the, with the potato water, and then you have a, a dashi. The most powerful way of getting umami, that's by fermentation. And um, I'm very happy um, to have joined a department which has a very uh, um, high level activity and, and, and knowledge about fermentation. And um, we've uh, just completed a, a piece of work here on the fer fermented fish sauces, or actually I should not even say fish sauce, I should just say fermented sauces, because um, we both fermented fish, uh, insects, game, peas, and that sort of a revival of the tradition of the, in, 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 old, uh, the, in the antique, where, where you fermented fish along the coast, or along the European coast, to have what is called garum, which is high in salt, but also high in umami. So that was a staple on, the, on all lunch tables and dinner tables in the old Rome, where you had wine, you had, uh, uh, you had garum, and, and, uh, and that is uh, uh, the, the source of, of um, umami. So that's, that's the way it looked. And, and the interesting thing that came out of this study, and this is where you really learn when so physicists work together with sensor, sensory science people that you get surprises here because it's not necessarily such that the, uh, the sensory panel would um, recognize uh, what is highest in umami because the other things that, that um, come, come in. Let me move on with a few other examples. One thing that um, uh, uh, I've been involved in when I was at SDU and uh, some of my good uh, colleagues and friends here who are continuing this work and uh, pioneering this work on how to use modern microscopy to look into the structure of food on small scales. And by techniques like, 
like uh, cusp uh, 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 microscopy, where you use sort of the Raman, Raman, um, uh, 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 the Raman excitation of the different kinds of the food stuff. You can actually distinguish between water, you can distinguish with fat, proteins, and, and carbohydrates. You can look into the food and see what the structure is on the scale, which is the colloidal scale. So here's an example of, um, of a colloidal system. This is mayonnaise. And uh, uh, this is a picture uh, that uh, Matthias Clausen made, and Matthias is, is here. So this is an oil, an oil, and, oil and water emulsion. Uh, you have a continuous water phase, and then you have all the oil droplets, and it's stabilized by an emulsifier. In this case, it's just a little bit of, of egg, egg yolk. So um, if you're interested in texture, which I am, I, 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 I think I want to see in this picture that this is creamy. And this is something I'm looking forward to discuss with people here, in particular Michael. Um, but I have, I have a sensation that this is a, is a creamy texture. You could turn uh, the emulsion around and make it in a water and oil emulsion and, and get this beautiful picture of butter or margarine. Or you could look into a meringue and see how the distribution of air bubbles, or you could look in a, in a, in a, in a whipped cream. So there are microscopies that open up for, 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 for the world on a scale which is interesting for the structure of food and the texture of food that is the part of the <coughs> structure you, you a tactile sensation in mouth can experience. And I'm looking forward here to work with uh, uh, people both in food science but also in physics who have access to um, even more powerful techniques that can look at, at uh, uh, the structure of, of food on, on even a smaller scale. Let me just in the passing to some of the um, things I'm really interested in at the moment, just mention something. I think I promised to give an example of communication-driven research. So uh, one thing we do in SME for Lude is that we quite often go out in schools and we go out to festivals and we teach, <coughs> um, teach young people about their senses and how they should be observant about, about the food they eat and, and learn about uh, taste and, and flavor and, and the company in which you enjoy it. And quite often we used chili as a very good example of sort of telling people that that hot is not a taste. Um, it's a chemistatic action on, on your tongue. It's actually a pain signal. So we use that quite often. And then sort of the question comes up um, when we talk about how hot is chili, because how can you measure it? And that's well now known how you can measure it, if you measure what is called capsaicin and some of the related capsaicin molecules, one can do that in an analytical lab. But the question is, where do you get hot chilies? And we sort of tend to say, well, we get it in hot climates, because that's at least sort of the folklore. So we teamed up with the primary producer, Lena Tvedegaard, who has a um, um, uh, uh, chili nursery, just the southern part of, of Sealand. And, um, and actually studied some of the, the local chilies grown here in coal greenhouses. And it actually turned out, to our big surprise, that it's not a matter of the climate, uh, whether you get it hot or not. So it's actually possible to, possible to make very hot Danish chilies in, in, in coal houses. So uh, I, I like this as an example of something that started in communication. And the gas, gas and physicists look at it and they say, well, uh, is there something interesting here? And you end up actually doing a, 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 well, a scientific study, and you can publish it in, in a decent journal, and um, and uh, uh, and also publish it uh, for, for for a general audience. Now I'm going to to finish off with with the two examples, so you can get your next um, two two other examples. You can get your next um, uh, tastings. I've for quite some years been interested in all sorts of food stuff from the ocean. And, um, and uh, in the sea, we not only find fish and shellfish, but we also find macroalgae, that is the, the seaweeds. And uh, there are also other things out there, which I'll come back to towards the very end. And there are a whole lot of interesting gastrophysical questions one can ask here. How to make, for instance, seaweed so it's tender and pleasant to eat and also have a nice flavor. And a little later, it's actually your dessert in this room. You'll get a dessert which is from seaweed which I worked on very hard, because it turns out you have to cook it for four hours to get the right texture for, for this particular seaweed. This is the seaweed I mentioned we studied for a Nordic dashi. It's called 
was a dollars or soil in, in Danish, and, and that actually ended up in a, a quite a number of scientific pieces of work, but it was actually inspired by an interest in, um, in uh, uh, seaweed as food. So let me give you uh, uh, these last two examples, will be, which will be on texture, which is something that um, I worked on for the last couple of years and put out a, a book here early, earlier this year on um, uh, sort of a popular science book on, on mouthfeel. And um, many of you would probably have eaten this. You can buy it at the, many of the fish stores. It's a, a, it's a seaweed salad, wakame, yasha wakame. And those of you who eat it, I'm pretty sure you like it because it's crunchy. Um, it would be very easy to make a similar product from, from Danish uh, sources. I would claim I could make an equally pleasant, nice, crunchy one from bladder rack. So uh, you're welcome to take the idea and go to the market. I, I, I'd like to sh uh, show an example, which I, not work I've been directly involved in myself, but I think it's, a, it's really a model example of how a gastrophysicist would work. And I'm sure many of you may have heard about this because it was in the Danish news when it was published. It was actually all over the world. Made a TV channels, they caught this up. How can you make crunchy jellyfish? And, um, and this is uh, Mia, who was, uh, he got, he got, she got her master's degree based on this work. So she asked herself the question, so this is now the way gastrophysics work, how can we make uh, crunchy uh, jellyfish? So that's a gastronomical question. Okay, so then she goes into the lab together with her supervisor, a very skilled uh, physical chemist, Pierre, Pierre Luc Hansen, who are also very familiar with the field of polyelectrolytes and gels. So he knows how to change the structure of a collagen network. So that's the physics that goes in. Some theory goes in and a lot of, of, of experimentation. And uh, there is a traditional way of preparing it in the East, which is really like when you prepare skin. You use some very harsh agents, in particular alum with an, an, an aluminum salt, which both changes the, 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 um, the taste to some extent, but it's also what it does what is called it collapsing the collagen network such that it could possibly be crunchy. So you should know, you, my, some of you may have done it or maybe done it without wanting to do it. If you dry a jellyfish or you cook a jellyfish, it's not going to be interesting gastronomically. If you dry it, it's very chewy, and very hard. If you cook it, you know, it's 98% water, so it's not, uh, it's not uh, going to lead to something interesting. No, you have to play around with the charges inside the polymer network you have to introduce what's called a poor solvent in the language of, of polymer science. And then Mia figured out she could, instead of using these hard agents, she could use ethanol and then um, uh, drag out the ethanol afterwards. And then she made a new technique for preparation of this jellyfish, where you basically get a wafer of a jellyfish. And I think I have, yeah, so this is, a, this is, this is the way the jellyfish looks. And it's very crunchy. And you can, then you can fry it and it's even more crunchy. So that's an example of something that now ends up as a recipe now. And uh, so the science in between, astronomical question, the science in between, there's a, some uh, nice science results that come out and can be published. And then there's also a message to the gastronomical world. So to the extent you want to eat jellyfish, you can use this recipe. So um, my um, uh, last example, is uh, something I uh, have been working on also recently, and that's a Japanese um, pickling technique called skemono. Uh, so it's a way of making crunchy uh, vegetables, to provide vegetables with a particular mouthfeel. And um, I've, um, uh, I'm just going to flash this. The, these techniques, there are a whole lot of different ways, traditionally in Japan, how to prepare vegetables both for preserving them to improve the nutritional value, uh, to change the texture. Um, and um, in, a, in the mind of the physical chemistry, it, it all boils down to changing the water chemical potential. How do you deal with that? And it's a sort of highly irreversible process. It matters the way you do it. So all these te curing techniques here, whether you do it in salt and acid and sugar, where they use uh, uh, various kind of pickling beds, where there are also some microbial activity. And some of these um, 
in, or enzymes like in Cody, some of these techniques go fast, some take years. And uh, the results can be both, I think, very beautiful, and, and it can also be very tasty. And in just a minute, I'm going to present you to, to the next tasting. But before that, let me just uh, hint to you, and we're only just um, looking into this. And this is, uh, so that's not much that come out yet, but this is sort of the way we're going. I'm looking forward to talk to some of the plant people to see if they can explain to me when you go through sort of circles of changing uh, water chemical potential that you basically drag out the water, not by osmotic pressure, but by drying and then put the water back. This is example how you see, this is uh, microscopy Matthias did. This is on a radish, this is a fresh radish, this is a dehydrated radish. It looks really very tired when you dry it out. And then you get the water back, the cell struct is very convoluted and it's very sort of squeezy, it's soft or it's flexible, but when you bite it, it's crunchy. It's much more crunchy than, than the fresh uh, uh, radish. And uh, now you're going to try that with two vegetables I've prepared for you. Uh, one is cucumber. So while I speak, try, try the cucumber. And uh, maybe we should just be quiet while you eat this and then listen. Wow. So you're now t you're tasting with your ears. You Note know that? So, and, and when you touch it, it doesn't look very appealing, very interesting, but it's crunchy. And I, I'll tell you, this will stay crunchy for months. So, um, so, uh, so that's um, that one of the one of the one of the uh, things you 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 science you could bring in here is that uh, one way of making it crunchy is that you have to cross bind the pectin in in the plant, and you can do that by calcium ions, and that's also why in traditional recipes, the Japanese recipes for this, they say use sea salt because it's high in, in calcium, magnesium, divalent ions. Actually, today we. We, we are sending to the printers and editors over here, uh, uh, and, uh, Joachim Berner, sending to the printers at Gyllendale a new book on skimono, uh, and uh, there you'll find all the secrets of the Japanese skimono. Uh, let me just flash um, the importance of, of uh, diving and ions and other two other pieces, kinds of cooking we were playing around with. Last year, we worked on making um, alternative um, Rizalamang. But you can, you can actually make Rizalamang using burner beans if you cook them in calcium. And I'm sure many of you know this in order to, when you cook beans. Uh, so you can make, uh, I would say you can make a Rizalamang, a Rizala burner uh, by uh, uh, white beans uh, just using the trick of, of calcium binding of, of, of the pectin. And I think. Uh, Calcium is actually also very important. Other, as, uh, other parts of the kitchen where you're really using the tricks as a masoner, where you play around with forming uh, different salts of calcium. So this is an example of something which is only published in a Danish journal, and uh, 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 Danish chemi on how to make calcified tomatoes, where you can make a certain shell with a very interesting crunch, and then you bite through it, and you get a, get a surprise. So let me finish with um, something I spent the summer uh, working on, and um, I'm getting interested in what is called cephalopods. And cephalopods uh, is also something there out in the ocean we don't eat. So that's where you find the squid, the octopus, and the, and the, and the, uh, and the cuttlefish. There are 800 different species, and there's a lot of them. At the moment, they constitute 5% of the fisheries um, uh, uh, catch, and it's, it's growing. And uh, some of you have had, uh, uh, I'm sure, squid and octopus. You know it's um, very difficult to prepare because there's a very tight window. Uh, either you cooked it very, very little, or you, cook it, you have to cook it very, very long. And that has to do with the way the structure of the collagen network is in the muscles of these organisms, which you should know they, are not, they don't have any support. They work. What is, as what is called a muscular hydrostat. They work by constant pressure and volume, so they can't move like I do here with striated muscles in one direction. They have muscles in all three dimensions, and that's the, that's the, that's the challenge when you want to make interesting food out of them. So um, this is what um, 
I'm working on at the moment. And to give you just an aspect of what could also be involved in this, I'm sure you all know that uh, fisheries are in big trouble. Uh, the, ca the many, many um, species uh, are fished out or they're endangered. So the question, how do we get more food from the ocean when we have growing population? So this is what I like to point to. There's some data here I found when I was looking into this. All populations of cephalopods all around the globe, they're growing. And they've been growing for the last 60 years. So this is something very, very, very dramatic. And why this is so, it's hard to tell. It could possibly be because the bonefish are going down, so their competitors, the, the cephalopods, are going up. So it's a shift, a global shift we're seeing, possibly induced by climatal changes. So one way of dealing with these increased populations is why don't we eat them? And this is, uh, there's some challenges here to, to how one could, as a, a gastrophysicist, uh, get into this. Now, I, I forgot um, to tell the ASAC that there were two tastings. There was a red one, which is also schemono. Uh, um, maybe you've eaten it. <laughs> uh, but uh, that should actually have gone along with the cucumber, because we now we soon come to the last tasting. So this is, um, um, uh, this is kohlrabi. A glass coal that has been dried uh, 24 hours and then rehydrated uh, in a marinade, special marinade. I'm happy to give you the recipe. And the color is due to hibiscus and red sisu. And red sisu is a plant. It has natural antiseptic uh, compounds, so you can use it as a preservative. And then it gives you this uh, nice red color. I'm sorry I skipped that, but I hope you enjoy the crunch. So. Um, and I'm not going, to, as a new professor here, to give a sort of a lengthy plan. I'm sure you're not even interested in that. But I've given you some hints to what might be coming. I'm looking very much forward to this broad and interdisciplinary collaboration here at, at Food and, and, the, uh, and the Nordic Food Lab, of course, and then also the Greater University of Copenhagen and the partners, also including Smear for Lude. And um, some of the things you can sort of imagine, I could. It, uh, Work on and will be working on our uh, new gastronomical use of seaweeds. Uh, these, uh, the uh, uh, the cephalopods, I'm sure, will be something that uh, I will work on, and, and uh, you will actually get a tasting a little later when you go outside. You'll get a tasting that has been prepared by, by squid. And um, then there's the uh, whole topic of crunchy vegetables. I think there's a need. Uh, for people with insight in food science to make vegetables more interesting, more tasty. And I think that the, the cure, one of the cure is applied the methods of dashi, that'll provide delicious taste. And the other thing is to work on the mouthfeel. So um, that's something that uh, could possibly lead to some interesting food innovation. And um, I'm also uh, looking forward to keep on this work across uh, uh, communication and, and science with, with Smay for Lude, um, which is a wonderful privilege to be able to work with that. And uh, already, uh, before I came here, there are sort of two nodes of the center here in sensory science and, and, and Nordic Food Lab. Um, now you're going to have your dessert. And uh, this is a dessert made from uh, finger tongue, uh, laminar gigatata, and um, it's a little black uh, square that is sitting there. And um, so pay attention uh, to the taste, the aroma, and the texture while you, while you eat it. And I, uh, uh, there's, no, uh, there's no gluten in it, I should mention to you. I should, you can happily eat it, but what is outside is rice flour. And otherwise, it's, it, it's a seaweed that has been cooked for quite a long time to provide the right texture. It then has been simmered in soy sauce and, and um, a little uh, sweet wine. And um, uh, what else did I put in? There's a little bit of ammonium chloride, just a tiny bit. Um, I don't think it's needed for many people to say, well, this could be like licorice. All right? Am I right? And it's very much the texture that that, that provides you with the, the feeling of licorice. So now I made it to the end. So there's some thanks here, and uh, this is in Danish, but uh, I'd like to, to thank uh, the, 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 the past department head, uh, Bjarke 
Park Christensen and also the interim head, Susanne Sørensen, and not least Anna Haldrup, the current head of, of food, for making it uh, quite easy for me to, ta to, 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 to actually decide to take the, the opportunity to come here. So thank you very much for that. I'd like to thank the section leader, uh, Vendor Brady. I'm really looking very much forward to working in the section. Uh, two other people who made it also very easy for me to, to, uh, to uh, accept the offer to come here. Uh, that, um, that the three people from Smag for Liv, that's Michael Bonfrost, who I've been working with before, and Anne-Marie Oles, and Anne-Marie is here, and then, then Per Müller. So all of you made it very easy for me to, to make the decision to come here. And I also like to ta uh, thank Philippa, Philippa Bungor, who is outside the, the uh, section secretary, who has been very helpful um, getting me installed in the new department. So I'm looking forward to, to, to working here. I'm looking forward to work, uh, of course, with everyone in the food department, but also with uh, Smith for Liu uh, by Nordic Food Lab. I'd like to thank my old uh, colleagues at uh, Memphis and Gastrolab, University of Southern Denmark. I'd like to thank Nordea Fonden for making it possible to um, install this uh, great uh, collaboration across the country. And also, I'd like to thank you all for coming. And, and before we leave, uh, I'll um, invite you to um, a real tasting, because what you had now is just something a poor gastrophysicist can do in his own kitchen. Now you're going to have real tasting prepared by the chef of Nordic Food Lab, Roberto Flora. He and his collaborators in the lab had worked very hard for the last week to make a very special treat for you. And uh, so you're going to get uh, smoked sashimi cucumber. You wonder what that is. It's not fish. Uh, in conbo oil, grasshopper garum, this is this fermented uh, fish sauce from, from, uh, from grasshoppers and lovers. Get a marinated egg and garum with tomato fudge, very special spots. And you tie the dashi with the kanbu and katsubushi. And there's also some uh, lapsang shushong tea in, in the dashi. And then you get a squid paste. And this is, this is wonderful. You can see chefs in the kitchen, they, they can deal with this. They just freeze the squid in liquid nitrogen and then grind it up in a t and pack with it, and it's so smooth. You'll love it. And then uh, you'll get a kefir drink. And I think uh, we will not take any questions because we're late. So thank you very much for listening.